We are enormously uh, limited in answering this question, sharing the gospel in Europe today. Uh, all that I can do is provoke you to love and good works. Um, I uh, think it is phenomenally important that we think about how we do it. I think about this question pretty well every day uh, because I'm thinking about not only my own country of Scotland, which, as you know, is the center of Europe um, in every way, uh, but I also, <laughs> I also uh, think about just different countries. We meet so many people from different countries. So what I'm going to do just now is because we're going to split into questions, um, I normally take questions as we go along, but because we're going to split into questions, I'm going to run through this. It will be, for some of you, you think incredibly superficial. I'll throw in a few things just to get you going and uh, a few ideas and then hopefully uh, discussion. I mean, I'd much prefer if we, if we did a whole lot more discussion. Just briefly, how did we get here? You know, it really is quite extraordinary. When my, my, my interest is in history. And Acts 16 is one of the most significant events in human history because Paul is basically heading for Kazakhstan. Uh, he's heading for the stands. He's heading for uh, probably even more towards India than anywhere else. And he's prevented by the Holy Spirit from doing so and is sent into Greece, into Macedonia. Now, that is just a key pivotal moment in world history and, of course, in European history. Because from that point onwards, Christianity spreads. It infects uh, the whole of Europe over a period of several hundred years. It is not instantaneous. Pretty well by the end of the New Testament, you've got to Spain. Uh, in my country, in Scotland, we are aware of uh, Roman soldiers who were Christians at the end of the first century. So Christianity spreads rapidly. There's a wonderful book by a man called Larry Sidentop, uh, The Making of the Modern Individual. Uh, I don't know if Larry is a Christian, but he identifies how in pre-Christian Europe, the Middle East, every, con every continent in the world, people did not believe in equality. They did not believe in uh, ideas of tolerance and so on. And Christianity gradually seeped its way in and changed everything. Now, that's important as we're thinking about Europe today because I would want to argue that everything that we value that we would consider to be Western European liberal values stem from Christianity, stem from this one event. The question how we get here, you have to think in terms of your own country as well. So yesterday I was speaking uh, at a couple of Polish churches and uh, I said to them, you think Poland's Catholic? They said, oh, of course. I said, yes, but this is Silesia. And they said, so what? Well, Silesia was 50% Lutheran until you threw all the Germans out. Um, Silesia, that's where the Hutterites came, this where you had the Hutterite Wars. In fact, there was a Reformation in Poland which threatened to be stronger than the Reformation in Switzerland before it was wiped out. You don't have to assume that Poland is Catholic. What I'm trying to say is every one of us needs to think of how we got here. In uh, Scotland just now you get people who say, oh, well, I'm really into the Picts. Now the Picts were a really wild tribe. And the idea is that the Romans came and Latins came and that's how Christianity came. And the Picts, they were good old Druids and kind of New Agers, kind New Agers apart from slaughtering a few babies every now and then. Uh, and that's the kind of image that people have. Except if you look at any of the Pictish artwork from the 5th, 6th centuries AD, what have they got on them? Crosses. They're Christian artwork. The Picts were not pagans. The Picts were one of the first groups converted to Christianity. And when you realize that and when you know that, it makes a phenomenal difference. So you, not just in terms of Europe, but your own culture asks, how did we get here? Um, I, I mean, I just think for me, and I'm not saying this because George is here, but to be Greek must be wonderful. Um, the, we, we would argue that the Scots are really just Greeks because there were Macedonians who traveled over to Italy and then to uh, northern Spain and then northern France and then Wales before they finally reached their nirvana, um, Scotland. So, uh, but to be Greek, you know, it's fa fa fantastic, the Christian history in that land. But I, I will guarantee you cannot find me one town or one village or one city or one country in the whole of Europe that doesn't have a Christian history. And that is important. Where are we? 
That's the next question we, are, we asked just now. Because far too many Christians live in the past. So uh, you will get people lamenting Christendom. Oh, I remember the days when. Usually said by people who don't remember the days, but think that they do. You know, remember, like I remember one old man, I remember the days when the streets were black with people going to church. Mm, you sure? You'd like to remember those days, that's what's in your head, but is that true? There is no doubt at all that Europe was the first continent Christianized, if you want to put it that way. Now, there's a kind of trendy thing amongst uh, evangelicals to say, well, we don't believe in Christendom, and the conversion of Constantine was a bad idea. Really? I think if you were a Christian at that time, you know, and Constantine was converted, you're going to be pretty positive about it because you're no longer being thrown to the lions, and that's a big deal. Um, I tend to find that uh, it's kind of middle-class Western Christians who go, oh, persecution must be a wonderful thing. No, it's not. Persecution is a horrible thing. Um, God can use it, but right now I'm thankful I live in Scotland and I can worship in freedom and that I'm not in Iraq or Egypt and could have my head cut off. And I have no intention of going to those countries deliberately to try and get myself martyred uh, in some kind of weird fetish that some Christians seem to develop. Persecution will happen in different ways. And maybe severe persecution is going to come to Christians in Europe. But the fact is that because Europe became Christianized, we developed the way that we are today. Where are we? Uh, you can look at it in different countries. In theory, 95% of people in Poland believe in God. In practice, less than 40% do. In theory, uh, my own country, Scotland, has secularized faster than any nation in history. So that uh, now, 90%, and I think 95% of people, don't attend any church whatsoever. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing. We were a people who were known as the land of the people of the book. And now people go, what book? They just don't know. Uh, I think it's really important for us to be realistic. What you find amongst evangelical churches is people tend to hide from the reality of the culture by uh, putting themselves in successful churches. If you've got 300 people in your local Baptist church in the middle of your city, it's wonderful, except if your city's population is 300,000, it's nothing, nothing. But it feels good when you're there. You're in a room that's packed with people. So I think we've got to be much more realistic about where we are, and that is really hard to face up to. I have uh, actually just today, just this morning, posted a podcast which says that, uh, and I'm going to be in trouble for it, but I believe that our national church in Scotland has now become apostate. Uh, and I think the church in Scotland overall is dying and needs resurrection. And even evangelicals find that language a bit strong. I think it's mild compared with either the prophets or Peter or Jesus. Um, but we need to be realistic without being depressed. Where are we heading? Who knows? Um, personally, I hope I'm heading for glory. Uh, but here's just a really, for me, an inspiring idea. Europe was the first continent Christianized, if you want to put it that way. It will be, it has become, the first continent de-Christianized. You know, the rest of the world, uh, Asia right now, there are more Chinese Christians than there are European Christians. The rest of the world is yeah, Africa, Asia, South America, certainly, are becoming much more Christianized. However, Europe's gone the other way. But what if Europe could be the first continent reconverted? Why do we just have to assume that it's going to decline and that's going to be it? Uh, oftentimes, you, I go to uh, mission agencies, particularly from the US, and uh, they, they like getting, you know, bang for their buck, let's put it that way. They like knowing that if they put so much money in, they're going to get so much results. Well, Europe's hard. You can plant a church in Africa. You can go and do mercy ministries in Belize. You can do lots of things, and you get immediate results. It's not going to happen in Germany. It's not going to happen in Poland. It's not going to happen in France. It's hard work. It's not spectacular work, and you're probably not going to end up with mega churches. But 
you could end up with something very different. The country in which most churches have been planted in the past decade is actually France. But it's small groups. Immigrants, but not just immigrants. There are thousands of, of, of small churches being hit. So, so where are we heading? I don't know. But it doesn't have to be that we're heading downhill. Persuasive, how do we, you know, re-evangelize Europe? And I, uh, we use this phrase a lot, persuasive evangelism, rather than apologetics. You are in the advanced apologetics network. If I went to most normal Christians in, um, I'm not saying that you're not normal. You might be perfectly normal. Uh, but, but some of you look a bit weird. But uh, um, the, If I went to most normal Christians and said, hey, this is, uh, uh, I'm going to be taking part in an advanced apologetics network. You know what they're going to think? They're going to think heavy philosophy, physics, you know, quantum mechanics. Uh, how can I prove God? Uh, you know, the, the five proofs and all that kind of stuff. Well, I actually love all that stuff. I really do. Uh, I love listening to the arguments and I love uh, the discussions and I, and I love that kind of apologia. But actually, apologetics in the traditional European sense, let me put it that way. Every single one of the Greek fathers called themselves an apologist. Every single one. Pretty well every single one of the Latin fathers, uh, church fathers, did as well. Because to them, communicating the gospel was what it was all about. And you do so in a reasonable way. Now, I think we've made a mistake. I, I'll throw this out. I think the term uh, evangelical is completely meaningless now. I'm not, I'm not sure that we can use it at all. Um, I think that we have developed a form of evangelicalism which means certain things to people in terms of style and ethos rather than content. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I'd, I'd hardly use the term evangelical except amongst evangelicals, and even then I've got to quantify it or qualify it. I think persuasive evangelism is giving people reasons to believe. It's saying to people, this is the most reasonable option. It's saying to people, this is the best option for living. It's saying to people, this is what makes the most sense. Why should anyone go to your church? You invite them to your church. Why should they go? What's the reason for going? The reason could be their history. The reason could be they have a particular um, need. But I think the reason we've got to give them is uh, without God, life is just awful. And with religion, life is awful. But you really, really, really do need Jesus. And we have got to persuade people that that is the case. And we do that in different ways. I think one of the ways that we, we, ha we have to do is we have to deal with what um, uh, Tim Keller helpfully calls the defeater beliefs. These are the beliefs, you know this, the beliefs that people have that stop them even considering. So just think it very simply. Go to uh, any person in the, the street here. Do you go to church? No. Why not? What are the reasons that they wouldn't even consider? It's not even an option. It's so far off the spectrum, they don't even consider it. They've not thought about it. There are a whole bunch of defeater beliefs, classic ones. I was uh, hitchhiking in Spain, and this woman uh, picked me up. She would be 27, 28, and at the time I was about that age. And she was utterly shocked, completely shocked, that I and my wife actually went to church. She said, I don't know. My parents went to church because they were Franco. You know, that's uh, what they were. But young people don't go to church. Why? Why would anyone go? Science has proven that God does not exist. We don't need God. Uh, for your entertainment, you don't need God. For family, you don't need God. You don't need any of these things. And so there are defeater beliefs that stop people even considering. And you have to deal with those in such a way that you are not um, mocking the people who hold them or setting up a very simple straw man to knock down. Again, to quote Tim Keller, if you're going to argue against a position, make sure you argue the position for the position better than the person in the pew would actually argue it, that, they, that you understand it and you grasp it and you know why people, I'll tell you a defeat or belief, it's here. I can't, I, I, I can't, personally, I won't be going to Auschwitz this time. I went to Auschwitz once before and I won't go again. I studied the Holocaust at university and uh, it's a phenomenal 
both defeat her belief and also reason for believing. It's just hard to grasp and to think. So they're defeat her beliefs. I think we've also got to say that our faith is reasonable. Um, and again, within the evangelical world, that is less and less you know, seen. On the one hand, you've got the kind of super apologetic geeks who always want to talk about theories and philosophies. And then on the other side, you've got people who say, well, we just have to love people. And I've seen this in evangelism. I've seen people go out and hand out Mars bars or sweets to someone and say, Jesus loves you. Now, as a non-Christian, I'm going, you idiot. How does that prove that Jesus loves me? You just gave me a sweet. You know, or I hear people say, you buy someone their meal in the restaurant and they'll know that Jesus loves them. No, they won't. They'll know they've got a free meal. That's all they'll know. People will quote St. Francis of Assisi, you know, preach the gospel, and if you have to, use words, which is one of the most inane comments you will ever hear. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, not least because it uses words to make the comment. It just doesn't make any sense. And yet people go, oh yeah, that's right. And that's why you'll find a vast majority of churches will spend far more money on what they perceive to be mercy ministries or showing people how wonderful Christians are than, or churches are than they do on outreach. I can think of a church I know that spent a million and a half pounds on redoing its building would not spend a thousand pounds on doing outreach and evangelism. Why? Partly because they consider outreach and evangelism to be a guy out on the street handing out tracts. Whereas for me, evangelism has got to be in the DNA of your church. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go to your church if it didn't teach the Bible. I wouldn't go to your church if there wasn't prayer. And I wouldn't go to your church if evangelism was not part of the DNA. If you're part of a group that says we are here to survive. I said this to the Polish guys yesterday. You are typical of small Protestant minority in a country where the vast majority are Catholic and to be Polish is to be Catholic. Therefore, not to be Catholic is to seem to be some kind of weirdo or traitor or whatever. So you've developed a defensive mentality. And most, lots of people, not most, but lots of people have developed that characteristic. If we're gonna reach Europe, we don't need a defensive mentality. We need an offensive mentality, not in the sense of offending people, which some of us can do very naturally, uh, but in the sense of um, just getting out there with the gospel. We are the beggars who found the feast, and we're going and sharing that with people. We are not the people who found the feast and then are putting up our arms trying to defend it so that we get to have it and others don't. And I think that's where our reasonable faith comes in. Christianity makes sense. No other philosophy makes sense. Existentialism doesn't make sense. Jean, uh, Richard Dawkins was asked, do you live like a social Darwinianist? He said, no, I couldn't. I remember interviewing or talking with a chemist, a PhD postdoc chemist, and I said, do you seriously believe that everything is, is just chemicals? She said, yes, I do. I said, do you live like that? She said, no, I couldn't. So you live inconsistent with how you live? Yes. Well, I think we, we have got, we've just got this tremendous uh, asset in terms of the gospel. The whole Christ to the whole person by the whole world. Um, that's just a, a cliche. Uh, uh, Will Metzger's book is perhaps the best thing on that. But we, we, we're not giving people little sound bites. We're trying to give people Jesus trying to give Christ to the whole world, so why we don't target particular groups. And we are trying to do it through the whole church. The lone evangelist, to me, doesn't make any sense. In fact, the lone evangelist tends to be, like most loners, quite eccentric and weird and happy within themselves, but useless for actually getting the gospel out. Now, the Lord may use them, but the Lord used a donkey. And if the Lord can use a donkey, he can use strange people. I, I, have no, I don't doubt that. It doesn't justify the methodology. I saw a man once, I was playing football in Edinburgh in a public area called the Meadows and with a bunch of my friends who weren't Christians. And I saw a man who was standing there. I, I thought, he can't be preaching. And my friend said, hey, Dave, that's one of yours. So what do you mean? He says, one of you Christians. Look, he's preaching and there's nobody there. And I thought, oh my goodness. So it is. So I went over to him. He said, excuse me, what are you doing? 
I'm preaching the word of God. Good. I love the word of God. I'm a Christian. Who are you preaching to? The people. I said, there are no people. The people who are walking by. There are no people walking by. And if they're walking by, they're going somewhere. They're not listening to you. Ah, he said, do not mock. C.H. Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, was once preaching, and there was a man hidden up a tree, and he was converted. And I said, you're preaching to the trees in the hope that somebody will be hiding in a tree? He didn't get, I mean, he was just nuts. And people admired his courage. I didn't. I didn't admire his courage. I thought, what are you doing? You're making a mockery of the gospel. Now, that's an extreme case. But in my view, we need to get the whole uh, Christ, the whole person by the whole church. Our church, it, it, on average in the United Kingdom, apparently, uh, this is a, a statistic, 84% of statistics are just made up, but never mind. Uh, this statistic suggests that, uh, good, you got it. <laughs> uh, this statistic suggests that from first hearing the gospel, on average, to professing faith in the UK, it's seven years. You're coming doing your evangelism explosion, expecting people to give their hearts to Jesus after 15 minutes conversation. It's not going to happen, usually. It can happen. I'm not saying we don't do stuff like that. I'm just saying that's not the methodology. It takes a long, long, long time. I have seen many people who, after many years, have come into church, come once. Don't see them again for another year. Come again. And it takes a long while and in my, for me, in evangelism, what I'm doing is I'm planting little grenades in people's heads that the Holy Spirit can use to explode at any particular time. I baptized a man who was a leading UN archaeologist who was head of the British Museum in London, and I baptized him when he was 97 years old because it took him that long to come to faith. Um, don't buy into all this demographic rubbish about most people are converted by the time they're 15 or 16 and therefore we've got to do that. How, how can we limit the Holy Spirit like that? And how do we know how God's going to work? You know, we're not into brainwashing. We're into communicating the good news. And I do believe that takes a whole church. There's a lot more to say about that, but um, just some other questions to help get us going. Is there a European mindset? Yes, I think there is. Uh, my view is that I could go to any city in Eastern or Western Europe and anyone under 50 would probably have pretty well the same mindset with cultural differences. There are cultural, of course, there are very strong cultural differences. Uh, there may be ethnic differences. There may be uh, differences because of religion like Islam and so on. But overall, I do think that there is a European mindset. There are differences, of course, between East and West. Um, there are uh, differences in um, society. It's questionable. I think it's very questionable whether Eastern Europe will go to, towards the sort of inverted commas progressive view on homosexuality that Western Europe has. Um, in Western Europe, we tend to think it's inevitable that the rest of the world will go the way we're going because we're the best. Uh, all Western European liberals are by definition racist um, because that's the way they behave. Uh, Richard Dawkins will say he's not racist, but he believes the epitome of human civilization are Oxford scientists. And the rest of us are all lower down the evolutionary tree. Um, and if you're from Africa, unless you get a Western European mindset, there's something wrong with you. If you're from Eastern Europe, you're, you're thicker than people from Western Europe, and so on. And they'll deny that, but in reality, I think that's what happens. But I do think there is a European mindset. What's the difference between first century and 21st century evangelism in Europe? Technology, I guess, um, speed of communication, confusion. Uh, they probably still held up signs in the first century as they're doing in the 21st century, telling you how long you've got to go. But uh, I'll try and make sure I stick with that. But I think there are some similarities. There is a lingua franca, which is not French now, it's English, uh, was Latin, was Greek in the first century. I personally believe that what is happening in modern Europe is that we are not progressing towards a secular liberal nirvana, but we are regressing into a Greco-Roman pagan view of the world. And it's in that world that the gospel first flourished. So why can't the gospel flourish there again? Have we missed anything? Well, there's loads, of course, that I've missed here because I'm just giving a broad overview and a broad sweep. 
But I want to suggest to you um, 10 target areas of engagement that I like. I'm going to just shoot through these. You can pick up any of them. Uh, The church involved in society in different ways, working with the very poorest, praying for the politicians, being involved with politics. Uh, I've found myself getting involved with a a number of politicians in the United Kingdom, uh, particularly in Scotland, and it's been very, very useful. Um, I have several who read stuff that I write, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and uh, I wouldn't give up on seeking to have the gospel be salt and light in the world in which we live. Uh, Society at a local level, at a uh, cultural level, and so on. Science. In my uh, congregation, we have a group called uh, Scientists in Congregations. In fact, last week, we had a lecture from Professor Haldane of St. Andrews University on philosophy, science, art, uh, and, and theology. Um, and it's a great way. Science is a great way of connecting with people. Um, we do not buy into the science and faith are opposed that seems to be part of the popular narrative. Think of ways that you can encourage that. Cafes. We do a lot of cafe evangelism. Um, we produced a wee book called... Uh, quench cafe culture evangelism Um, and I love doing that I just love going to cafes Uh, I love speaking for 20 minutes then people firing questions we get lots and lots of discussion Uh, marketplace in other words go to Athens Uh, Acts 17 music Uh, atheists ain't got no songs Uh, you just go and look uh, music. I mean, you can use music in all sorts. Now, I'm not talking about particularly Christian music. I'm not sure there is even such a thing. Is there a Christian, is there a Christian music or a Christian building or a Christian potato? I'm not sure. But I think music is a gift that God has given us. As Calvin has said, of all gifts, it is the most powerful. And it can be used in lots of ways to question and to get people to think. Um, art. Um, go into an art gallery. If you cannot communicate and tell the gospel through an art gallery, there really is something wrong with you. You're either in a 21st century contemporary art gallery, which has nothing religious and therefore nothing worthwhile, um, or or you just don't understand what is is going on. Art is just a great legacy for that. Medicine. Um, We do a lot of work with Christian Medical Fellowship and, uh, you know, medicine, uh, the way that medicine is going, the Christian influence (coughs) in medicine is huge. History, well, I've spoken about that already. There is an apologia of history. Uh, Media, we really need to get more Christians involved in the media. Um, I'm operating on a basis that I've got two separate counters here, so I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to get this. Uh, This was a really, really crazy idea that we had. I mean, we use media. I use the internet. I use Facebook. I use Twitter. I hate them, but I use them because they're a good way of contacting with people Connecting with people, they are not a good way of communicating, largely. You really need to meet people. To me, evangelism is still primarily one-to-one. It's still people sitting and talking with people, or, you know, it needs the human body uh, and person uh, there. But other media as well. I had this really crazy idea. I realized that, at least in my culture, most people don't read newspapers now. They used to, but not now. You don't get your news from newspapers. Where do you get it? Well, most people don't bother, but if you do bother, it's the internet. But the problem with the internet, it's self-selecting. You focus on what you are interested in. And and even now, Google and others choose it for you. The subjects that they think you are interested in based on your previous viewing history. So people are actually becoming more narrow-minded, less aware culturally. The one exception to that in print media are quality magazines. Magazines in the United Kingdom, like The Spectator and The Economist, are flourishing. So I thought, what if we had a Christian magazine that wasn't about the church, primarily, and wasn't about theology, and wasn't even evangelism, but it was about news, about what was going on in Europe, that was well-produced, quality art, um, gave news from, we've got the biggest network in Europe, so gave news from Ukraine, or Norway, or Italy, uh, Scotland, or whatever, then, and then we could use that as a design it, do it as a coffee table magazine you can leave on your coffee table that people would pick up and read. So you are in a great position here because uh, this crazy idea came to fruition this week and we got delivered. We've got an Australian editor, a Scottish designer, we've got writers from all over Europe and uh, my board agreed to go with this 
This is the very first edition of Solas. It's not a magazine about Solas. It's a magazine about Europe. It's European news, European art, European culture. We'd love to have it done in different languages. Uh, I can say more about it and questions and so on. I've got a free copy for you all at the end as well. That's one example uh, of media. Philosophy. Everybody thinks. Everyone has a philosophy. Your job is to communicate the gospel by getting people to think. Uh, churches. We need churches all over the place that are looking for... Um, that the church is the best means of communicating the gospel. Uh, and we need to remember that. My personal view is that if any church does not exist in order to communicate the gospel, it'd just be better off dying. So uh, we, that's why how urgent and important this actually is.